This is the extrovert's danger. He gets sucked into objects and completely loses himself in them. Carl Jung outlines a psychology of the different types in his collected work 6, Psychological Types. The two basic types are known as introverted and extroverted, which are classed as attitudes. The attitudes, that is extroversion and introversion, are defined based on their relation to the subject and object. The observer of a situation, you, are the subject, and those things that happen outside of you, that is, the continual flow of events that make up the situation, is the object. An individual is unlikely to be just purely introverted or extroverted. Rather, one can be called an introvert or extrovert if he is habitually so. Therefore, one can be introverted and extroverted, and it can depend on the circumstance. Consider the fact that it is cold outside and that prompts one person to put on his coat, while another, who wants to get hardened, finds that unnecessary. The former is related to the object, that is, the world outside, whereas the latter is related to the subject, himself, the world inside. The extrovert's actions is based on the cold, whereas the introvert's actions is based on what he interprets it to be. The extrovert has an outward turning of libido, or life energy, whereas the introvert has an inward turning of the libido. Jung writes, It is sufficient to note that the peculiar nature of the extrovert constantly urges him to expend and propagate himself in every way, while the tendency of the introvert is to defend himself against all demands from outside, to conserve his energy by withdrawing it from objects thereby consolidating his own position. But introversion and extroversion are not conscious attitudes which we can decide or not decide to have. Like dreams, they are natural things that happen to us. These attitudes are distributed evenly across people, much like how there is an even split of male and female in a given population. But the attitudes at base are attitudes of adaptation. One's environmental factors, his childhood for instance, may better fit one attitude over the other, and if so, he can adapt to use the other attitude. Jung writes, Ultimately, it must be the individual disposition which decides whether the child will belong to this or that type, despite the constancy of external conditions. Naturally, I am thinking only of normal cases. Under abnormal conditions, i.e. when the mother's own attitude is extreme, a similar attitude can be forced on the children too, thus violating their individual disposition, which might have opted for another type if no abnormal external influences had intervened. As a rule, whenever such falsification of type takes place as a result of parental influence, the individual becomes neurotic later and can be cured only by developing the attitude consonant with his nature. So what exactly is extroversion? The extrovert is one whose actions are recognizably related to external conditions. Another person, for example. If that other person is feeling sad, the extrovert may feel sad as well. Jung writes, if a man thinks, feels, acts, and actually lives in a way that is directly correlated with the objective conditions and their demands, he is extroverted. His life makes it perfectly clear that it is the object and not the subjective view that plays the determining role in his consciousness. Naturally, he has subjective views too, but their determining value is less than that of the objective conditions. Consequently, he never expects to find any absolute factors in his own inner life, since the only ones he knows are outside himself. His inner life is subordinated to external necessity, though not without a struggle, but it is always the objective determinant that wins in the end. His whole consciousness looks outward, because the essential and decisive determination always comes from outside. Objective happenings, that are things in the external world, have an inexhaustible fascination for him. So there are clear benefits of those who are extroverted. That is, when one is in a tricky environment, he is much more able to adapt to it. This is of course a much more effective mechanism 
to change oneself according to what is demanded of him rather than changing the demands to fit himself. Whilst there are benefits of extroversion, namely adaptation to one's environment, there are also drawbacks, namely that of conformity. Jung writes, an individual who adjusts himself to it is admittedly conforming to the style of his environment, but together with his whole surroundings he is in an abnormal situation with respect to the universally valid laws of life. The moral laws governing his actions coincide with the demands of society, that is, with the prevailing moral standpoint. If this were to change, the extrovert subject of moral guidelines would change accordingly, without this altering his general psychological habits in any way. Extroverts are therefore more likely to say and do things in order to be liked, rather than in accordance with the truth. Jung continues, It requires observance of laws more universal than the immediate conditions of time and place. The very adjustment of the normal extroverted type is his limitation. He owes his normality on the one hand to his ability to fit into existing conditions with comparative ease. For instance, to the career that holds out good prospects at this particular moment. He does what is needed of him, or what is expected of him, and refrains from all innovations that are not entirely self-evident, or that in any way exceed the expectations of those around him. In other words, the extrovert does well in an organisation, and works well with others and in the group. But what if the group in which he strives to be a part of, which he derives his identity and safety from, is corrupt? It is thus harder for the extrovert to say what he might need to say, to speak his truth when he sees the wrong around him. He is attached to the external group rather than the inner truth. We have seen plenty examples of this in just the previous century. That ordinary people, you the viewer and and I the creator of this content, are capable of the most monstrous evil. If there is any lesson of those dark events, let it be that one must recognise that the split between good and evil runs through himself, and it is he who must, as dangerous as it may seem, speak what he knows to be right. Like the biblical Elijah, who lived in a time where every person had lost their way, he, scared for his life, said to the king that what he was doing was wrong. He spoke his truth and did not conform. Let your credo be this. Let the lie come into the world. Let it even triumph, but not through me. Alexander Solzhenitsyn He who does not listen to his internal world, his inner voice, will gradually suffer bodily pain, so that the extrovert who is so oblivious of himself is forced to take it seriously. His normality must also depend essentially on whether he takes account of his subjective needs and requirements. And this is just his weak point, for the tendency of this type is so outer-directed that even the most obvious of all subjective facts, the condition of his own body, receives scant attention. The body is not sufficiently objective or outside, so that the satisfaction of elementary needs which are indispensable to physical well-being, is no longer given its due. The body accordingly suffers to say nothing of the psyche. The extrovert is usually unaware of this latter fact, but it is all the more apparent to his household. He feels his loss of equilibrium only when it announces itself in abnormal bodily sensations. These he cannot ignore. It is quite natural that he should regard them as concrete and objective, since with his type of mentality they cannot be anything else for him. A too extroverted attitude can also become so oblivious of the subject that the latter is sacrificed completely to so-called objective demands. To the demands, for instance, of a continually expanding business because orders are piling up and profitable opportunities have to be exploited. Young says that the most common bodily symptom of the exaggerated extroverted type is hysteria, which a patient experiences physical symptoms that have a psychological rather than an organic cause. For instance, a singer whose fame has risen to dangerous heights that tempt him to expend too much energy suddenly finds he cannot sing high notes because of some nervous inhibition. A constant tendency to make himself interesting and to produce an impression is a basic feature of the hysteric. The corollary of this is his proverbial suggestibility, his proneness to another person's influence. Another unmistakable sign of the extroverted hysteric 
is his effusiveness. The reaction of the unconscious produces another class of symptoms having a more introverted character, one of the most typical being a morbid intensification of fantasy activity. In other words, the extrovert is so far lost in the outside world, he forgets the very thing which allows him to experience it, the body. That he forgets his body and pays little attention to it, and it deteriorates, is evidence of his psychic situation also. The body is the symptom, his psyche is the cause, for he cannot ignore the objective signs that the body provides. It is the young lost university student who believes his pain and suffering is always and only the fault of everyone else but himself. He will protest against the powers that be, all the time ignoring his own inner life and what he can do and how he might be at fault and how he should take responsibility of his life. This is the extrovert's danger. He gets sucked into objects and completely loses himself in them. Man is not a machine that can be remodelled for quite other purposes as occasion demands, in the hope that it will go on functioning as regularly as before, but in a quite different way. He carries his whole history with him. In his very structure is written the history of mankind. The historical element in man represents a vital need to which a wise psychic economy must respond. Somehow the past must come alive, and participate in the present. Total assimilation to the object will always arouse the protest of the suppressed minority of those elements that belong to the past and have existed from the very beginning.